As children growing up in the message, we always considered it a treat when we got to visit downtown Jeffersonville. Our family was migratory, moving from one message church in one state to another message church in another state for most of my younger life. We lived in cities from Arizona to South Carolina and everywhere in between, always longing to move back to the hometown of our prophet. Visits to Jeffersonville usually included a brief visit with family, Sunday morning and evening services at the Branham Tabernacle, and occasionally a Wednesday evening service. One of the favorite experiences for message believers was a visit to Schimpf's Candy Store. Schimpf's Cinnamon Red Hots were the Prophet's favorite candies, and they were our favorite candies as well. Grandma always had a can of them on her kitchen counter, as did my aunts and uncles. If the prophet liked Red Hots, we were sure to like them. Many families in the message also had a white can of those Red Hots on their kitchen counters and offered them to message guests who came to visit. Even message families from out of state ordered cans of the Red Hots and had them shipped to their homes. Some families, those who visited Jeffersonville, purchased them in person at the little store inside the row of the old-fashioned brick buildings in downtown Jeffersonville. Even as an adult, I found that visiting the candy store brought back fond memories. We'd park along Spring Street, often under an awning that said, La Rose, and stand in line to purchase a can of those Red Hots. As a child with candy in mind, I never thought much about La Rose, or any of the other storefronts in the heart of old Jeffersonville. At one time, La Rose was a big attraction. It was the first theater in Jeffersonville to have a talkie, or a motion picture with sound. The Prophet wasn't the only child to enjoy those Red Hots. Back in the early 1900s, children would line up outside La Rose to see the latest films. The in thing to do at the time was to visit Shimps for Peanuts and Red Hots before watching the latest Talkie. Inside the theater, three sections of seating were available, and the theater was filled with people. It was also open for an afternoon matinee packed with children, Peanuts, and Red Hots. Entertainment in the message was taboo, and movies were no exception. The Prophet harshly condemned the entertainment industry, especially movies and television. For decades after his death, many families who followed the message abstained from various forms of entertainment. This was a touchy subject for many. Not every family had the same level of abstinence from entertainment, and not every message church abided by the same rules. In the Prophet's hometown of Jeffersonville, for instance, my grandfather was very rigid in his preaching against entertainment. Some churches in the message had large bands and choirs. There were message churches that condemned their counterparts, reminding them that the prophet condemned a church with a choir. The prophet would make statements like, this, their modern strip teases are their choirs, and certain sects of the message would frown upon the strip tease message churches with choirs or musical bands. I had a natural desire for music and really didn't miss watching video. Like many of the migrant families in the message, my family would have a television for a few years, feel condemned by preaching from one of the more rigid sects, destroy their television, and get another one after attending a church with less strict sets of rules. When my family decided to rid their house of the television during my teenage years, I buried myself in music. This too was taboo. The prophet had told my grandfather that Christians shouldn't play guitars. According to my grandfather, my grandma, aunts, and uncles had at one time been talented musicians. Before meeting the prophet, the family traveled the country evangelizing, playing and singing a variety of instruments, from an accordion to a piano, organ, and guitars. Grandpa often told the story about the prophet telling him that his family must quit playing those instruments and that they shouldn't be played in the church. 
only a piano and organ were allowed in the Branham Tabernacle under Grandpa's authority. When I found a photograph of the prophet playing a guitar, I hung it on my wall and I enjoyed my guitar. My maternal grandfather, who lived in a different region of the country and belonged to a much different sect of the message, rejected the notion that the prophet spoke against musical instruments. He had given me the photo of the prophet and his guitar during my early teens, and much to the dismay of my father, had given me my first guitar. This, as you can imagine, caused quite a friction. I sided with my maternal grandpa and my new guitar, and I did my best to ignore the insulting comments that came from my father's side of the family. At the time, I formed the opinion that if the prophet said two things that we thought were contradictory to each other, we must not understand what he said about them. I always wondered about the history behind the photo, though, because it didn't seem to fit the image of the prophet that we had been accustomed to seeing. Learning that the prophet was active in the church led by Roy E. Davis in 1933 was a surprise, but learning what the early church was like inside was an even greater surprise. Besides having an immoral and criminal background, Roy Davis himself was an entertainer. According to the newspapers, he was known throughout Texas as a singer and masher, a person who entices others through music and religion. It was easy to see that from his leading the choir for Reverend Ralph Rader and stealing his congregation, not much had changed from the time of his prison sentence in the early 1900s to his transition to Jeffersonville, Indiana in the role of a Pentecostal minister. As the official spokesperson for the Ku Klux Klan during the early 1920s, Davis held public debates to both entertain and to recruit. His letters to the editor of the local newspapers in Louisville and southern Indiana served the same purposes. Even his meetings with the advertised claim to have been converted from a spiritualist was nothing more than entertainment for the purpose of recruiting. Roy Davis knew the business, and he knew it well. Whether it was applied to the Ku Klux Klan, the Knights of the Flaming Sword, or his local Jeffersonville, Indiana, Pentecostal church. I knew that if the newspapers described him using phrases like singer and masher, he was using his style of religious meetings to seduce. Entertainment brought the crowds, and the crowd brought money and power. Davis's brothers were also musically inclined, playing multiple musical instruments and attracting the crowds to their music. When Davis was released from prison in 1931 and Roy's brothers migrated to Jeffersonville, Indiana to help him recover, they held a Pentecostal revival with singing. When they left town, no doubt on secret missions for the white supremacy groups they participated in, Roy Davis would return with his party to introduce new songs to his congregation. I couldn't help but compare this to the current Branham Tabernacle in its unusual stance against music. When did the music stop? A message brother and sister told me that the Jeffersonville Courthouse still had records for both the Prophet and Roy Davis. They also informed me that the records were freely available. A person could simply walk into the building and grab a book of records off the many shelves, open it, and read. In this day and age, that was both highly unusual and fortunate for my inescapable curiosity. I made a quick trip and found records dating all the way back to the 1800s. It took some time for me to learn how the system worked. There were rows and rows of books stacked floor to ceiling in multiple rooms, some of which had tables that allowed me to lay them down, open them, and read. They were heavy books and brittle. Not only did I have to handle each book with extreme care to keep them intact, I had to make sure that they were placed back in the correct order. Under the tables were even more rows of books, often in unusual or disorganized sequences. One rack on the left-hand side of the room might stop at one set of years and continue under the table with another set of years and finish on another wall with the remaining years. There were several different rooms filled with books, schematics, and other documents. One room contained all the property records, including maps with the layouts of each neighborhood in the city 
archive by year. Those maps were numbered, and each number was used in another room to access the purchase, tax, and other history of the properties. Yet another room contained the deed to each property. One room contained the records of civil and criminal court records. It was almost overwhelming. The couple had found the deed for the church when it was transferred from Roy E. Davis Sr. to his son, Roy E. Davis Jr. Roy Davis's Pentecostal church was officially sold May 10, 1934. They had given me a copy of the document, which I was also able to find at the courthouse. With those documents, specifically the dates of each document, I could then travel to the nearby public library and search through the rolls of microfiche containing the newspaper archives. By looking at the roll containing the first few months of 1934, I was able to link a newspaper article to a court record. With the court record and the newspaper article, I was able to search the transcripts of the Prophet's sermons and establish a timeline. The Prophet's timelines were not always accurate, but by matching his descriptions, I could link a story in the timeline to the actual recorded history. A few days after Roy E. Davis Sr. sold the church property to his son, on May 29, 1934, the newspapers contained the first mention of the Prophet in the newspapers having a congregation. Roy Davis's church had closed, according to both the prophet and the newspapers, had burned down, and the land had been given to his son. From all appearances, Davis had handed his congregation over to the prophet. The prophet said that he was Davis's assistant pastor until Davis's Pentecostal church had burned. According to the permit, this happened in April of 1934. After the church burned, all traces of Roy Davis seemed to disappear and did not reappear until the mid-1940s when the prophet first started his healing ministry. This made me even more curious. What would make Davis decide to abandon his congregation and leave town? In the books of records found at the courthouse, I found an entry in the circuit court's record for Roy Davis in 1934. He had filed a lawsuit to claim the estate of Miss Laura Bell Eakin and sued several people, churches, and organizations, including the Walnut Ridge Cemetery and the local Methodist Church. Bell Eakin was the one previously healed in Davis's revival meetings. Searching this date in the newspaper archives, I found that on March 30, 1934, the story appeared in detail in the Jeffersonville Evening News. When the wealthy Miss Eakin died, her fortune was supposed to be dispersed according to a last will and testament she had signed a few years earlier. According to Davis, however, Miss Eakin had created a second will and testament, and he was the only beneficiary of her estate. This no doubt angered many people in the town of Jeffersonville. Shortly before his church burned to the ground, and Davis moved back across the river to Louisville, Kentucky, where he started preaching at the Bethel Rescue Mission with his brother Dan. About the same time, Roy and Dan Davis used the mission as a base of operations and closed their Jeffersonville churches. Roy's time there was short-lived, however. Roy Davis was soon extradited to Arkansas on charges of grand theft auto, and elders from his church transitioned to the Billy Branham Pentecostal Tabernacle. From that time, his immoral lifestyle caught up with him, and he eventually landed in the Huntsville Prison in Walker County, Texas. In a record dating July 9, 1940, the prison log listed Roy Davis as a sex pervert. There were so many entrances to trails of research that I found it difficult to focus. I shifted my attention back to the early days of the musical talent in the Billy Branham Pentecostal Tabernacle. If there were any details about the entertainment in the Prophet's early church, I wanted to find it. The best place to start was in the newspaper archive, so I started sifting through the rolls and rolls of microfiche at the Jeffersonville Public Library. After the deed to the tabernacle was signed in 1936, the church was advertised in the newspapers as the Pentecostal Tabernacle. Continuing Davis's strategy, the church was deeply involved with music. 
The Prophet's first church had a stringed band, a choir, an orchestra, and an advertised song service with many local recognized singers. Some of these singers were frequently involved with the music of other churches, which sounded very much like the Prophet invited popular local singers to attract bigger crowds. One family in the Prophet's church, the Broy family, had a band. This musical family is where the Prophet would meet his second wife, Mita Broy. Though the Prophet would later condemn churches with choirs, the Billy Branham Pentecostal Tabernacle had a choir that was advertised in the local newspaper. This choir was not only active in the church, it was active in competition settings. In fact, the choir was a prize-winning musical group. They were so good that they competed in contests and won. The Pentecostal Tabernacle invited other musical groups to perform with them at the church, such as the Henryville Orchestra, and the Pentecostal Tabernacle musicians performed at other churches, sharing their musical talent with other Christians. When Ralph Rader opened his new Holiness Tabernacle, the prophet preached and his musical band performed to celebrate. I began to wonder, when and why did it stop? The prophet came from a musical family. Even the early photos of his ministry that I had in my collection made it evident that music was a part of his early life. When did the Billy Branham Pentecostal Tabernacle lose its love for music? When did the prophet start condemning other churches instead of participating with them? When did he stop using stringed instruments in his church? It was time to focus my research on Hope Brumbach, the prophet's first wife. From the prophet's own account, it was her death that signified a turning point in his life. Who was Hope Brumbach? How did she meet the prophet? What was she doing in Roy E. Davis's Pentecostal church? More importantly, why did her mother not want the prophet to take her around those Pentecostals? Was it because of the religion or something else?